Hello, hello! You're listening to Archaeopolitics, a Harry Potter reread podcast focusing on politics in the wizarding world. As always, I'm Adri, one of your hosts and a recovering English major. And I'm Helene, your co-host and producer. And today we're going to be talking about Chapter 18, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. But before we get there, Helene, how are you? Oh, just recovering from Thanksgiving, as I'm sure many of our American uh, listeners are all doing as well. Trying to bridge that gap between Thanksgiving and Christmas. (laughs) (laughs) Stuff like a turkey, you know, just gobble gobble. Uh, what's your favorite Thanksgiving side dish? Oh, man. T- I think it's a three-way tie, honestly. Well, okay, I guess, tell okay. me. Okay, well, I guess, okay, probably number one is going to be mashed potatoes and gravy, personally. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, Solid choice. But honestly, it's mo- it's really, a, this year specifically, it was a three-way tie between the mashed potatoes and gravy, the stuffing, and the cranberry sauce. Okay, okay. I'm there with you up until cranberry sauce. <laughs> Oh man, I love that's it. Just a, my, that's just that's just a personal preference. <laughs> my sister and I make the meal every year, and this year we decided since we the family always eats like eats and prefers to have all the sides, but like doesn't really care about the turkey as much. And the turkey is a ton of work and way too much food. So, um, in order to like focus on making the sides and the stuff that we actually like, we decided to make um, lamb instead of turkey this year. Oh, that's awesome. Like, I would have just brought a rotisserie chicken. I'd be like, yeah, happy we thought Thanksgiving, about that. Like, yeah, we, here's we, a rotisserie we, chicken. <laughs> yeah, we thought about that. But my family um, is are very much um, like red meat eaters. Uh, honestly, I think we would have preferred to have steak. Yeah, yeah. But my dad likes to cook the steak. Um, he likes to grill. And uh, he didn't want to, like, grill out in the snow or whatever. So we made lamb instead. Um, cause it's, it was really cold and snowy, uh, I think during that time. So yeah, I mean, we, we really just went all out on the sides. My sister and I make everything from scratch and we just really hit it out of the park with everything. All the sides were great. It was great. I mean, it sounds amazing. Love yeah. this for you. Thank you. I did not cook one single thing <laughs> this Thanksgiving. <laughs> I actually really glorious. enjoy it. I really enjoy it a lot. But I think it's because my sister and I work so well in the kitchen together. Um, well, if you have like a great partnership, I say yeah. more power. Yeah, it's it's fine as long as my mother just does not get involved. As long as my mother <laughs> stays out of the kitchen and doesn't touch a single thing, it's great. Um, Do you hear the Celine's mom? Stay out of the kitchen. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> believe me, we try every year. and But... Uh, I just I love like working with my sister on the on the meal and she's she's the chef and I'm the sous chef and she runs the kitchen really smoothly and um, I just really I really enjoy it. So I had a, I had oh, a good this time. This is great. This is great. Well, the last couple of Thanksgivings, uh, we hosted Seth's parents. So, you know, there was a lot of cooking done on our kitchen and our end. So it was kind of like a lightweight Thanksgiving on this year because we were you know staying with his sister and the thanksgiving was hosted at another family's house so we just brought like something to the festivities and our niece maya who is now 21 uh, made mac and cheese from scratch so i didn't have to do anything like we brought like a huge thing of mac and cheese and it was great that's amazing Nice. Well, and his sister made the mashed potatoes, so, you know. Yeah. I basically made the entire mashed potatoes by myself this year. Um, like, God bless you. And Peeling all those potatoes? Yep. Peel all the potatoes, boil them, mash them, add in the cream and the, um, and the salt butter. and the butter. And, oh, man, it, they were some damn good mashed potatoes. I was really proud of them. I am so proud of you. Thank you. We also make this sweet potato casserole that's basically mashed potatoes with sweet potatoes, um, but like sweet. And then you put uh, marshmallows on it and put it in like broil them in the oven and they get all. So just FYI, my mom's favorite American Thanksgiving dish 
is the sweet potato casserole. Yeah, it's my dad's favorite. Yeah. And it's funny because like always, like that's not a thing in Puerto Rico, right? So like her first real American Thanksgiving was during our wedding. Because uh, we also got married during Thanksgiving weekend. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, your anniversary is around this time. Yeah. So so it was Thanksgiving is a Thursday. We got married the Saturday after. <laughs> and so so uh, my husband's family hosted Thanksgiving that year. And we were all like together. And she tasted the <laughs> sweet potato casserole. And she was like, what is this deliciousness? And I was like, right. oh, mom. Yeah, it's great. It is it is oh, wow. really an unsung <laughs> hero because I feel like it's not a normal side dish that everybody like immediately thinks of when they think of Thanksgiving, but it's honestly a favorite across many, many families. So, Yeah, So, and, and dessert-wise, she loved the pumpkin pie. She's a huge fan of pumpkin, of yeah, pumpkin pie. Yeah, I'm... I don't like pumpkin flavored anything. Um, so this, so we always tend to settle on different pies. In the last two years, we did a French silk and an apple pie instead. Ooh, I'm a big pecan pie person myself. I have only had pecan pie like once or twice, and I liked it. But for some reason, we never have that. I don't know why. I, I my favorite pie though is banana cream. Okay. Okay. Or French silk. Said, Honestly, if we could have a banana French silk, I'd do it. Do it. Like, that sounds delicious. Honestly, that sounds amazing. Why hasn't someone done it? I know. I kind of, maybe, maybe I'll. Million dollar my, idea, Helene. I'm going to convince my sister to to make it with me over Christmas. That's what I'm going to do. So are we thinking, like, are you going to make a banana cream pie and then, like, add some, like. I think I would do, like, a layer of silk. French okay. silk. On the okay. Box. And so then, like, crust, uh, banana cream. Yeah, crust layer of like the chocolate mousse or whatever. Ch- uh-huh, French silk. Uh-huh. I don't know how. No, I'm not really sure how French. How I think it's chocolate mousse. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they're different. And then a layer of the banana cream, and then like the whipped cream on top. I feel like that would be, Ooh. and then the chocolate shavings on top of that. I feel like that would be amazing. I, if no one has made this before, like, what are we doing? What are what are humans doing? Why do we exist on this earth if not to make things like that? But Helene. What if that's your purpose in life? That's my purpose, yes, to be the creator of banana, <laughs> uh, bananas, French silk pie. Yes. <laughs> oh man, I'm excited. I'll have to update you, and if we make it, I'll send you a picture and I'll I'll uh, give you my review. Well, you're also gonna have to take a picture for the audio feed. Come yeah, that's on, true. that's true. All the listeners, get ready for your. Uh, first French silk banana cream pie extravaganza. extravaganza. Oh my god! <laughs> I can't believe we said the same thing at the same time again. <laughs> should we? Should we talk about Harry Potter now? Oh, not um, yet, not yet. I one thing I oh, I would oh. be remiss. I'm sorry. Um, so I want to apologize to the listeners for not having an episode up last. Uh. Monday. Uh, We're recording this on uh, Wednesday, November 30th. Um, What ended up happening was um, my father-in-law, Seth's dad, passed away on November 16th. So that that was our recording date. Wednesdays are usually our recording date. Um, And then, so I said, Helene, (laughs) sorry, we're going to have to like leave Royal Plaza right now. So um, yeah, we can record that date. And then the next uh, Wednesday was the day before Thanksgiving. So again, couldn't record that date either. We were already going to take that off anyway. So, you know, just wanted to let everyone know the reason why we couldn't record um because we said it was you know a family emergency but just letting you know we had a devastating loss to our family um and he will be remembered very fondly and by me and everyone else um so yeah so that was what happened but now we can talk about better things (laughs) which is (laughs) yeah i mean obviously i mean we talked about off mic but um Obviously, I feel very deeply for you and and Seth, um, especially having to deal with all the scariness of the potential 
uh, of losing my father um, in the coming years due to his recent diagnoses and, and health scares. So I can only imagine how Seth is feeling and how you must also be feeling. So it's never e- easy losing someone, even you know, even if it's even if you know it's happening or it's sudden or whatever it is. It's yeah. always it's always difficult. So and I mean, I thought it was incredibly <sighs> poignant in a way that we had been talking for episodes, it seems, at a time about loss and memorialization and yeah. all these things about. Um, grief and how we grieve and how we remember yeah. those who have left us and then this happened so it's um, crazy and then this chapter yeah. is all about remembrance of someone who died even though it's not really in great light yeah but it's all it's all talking about about that too so and that's obviously something i think we will definitely discuss in this episode yeah, as well, for sure so. so i thought i was like really <laughs> i mean there's <laughs> a great like moment ever to uh lose someone right but i was like really we we've been talking about this for literal weeks on the show uh not that everything <laughs> is about me obviously but you know <laughs> yeah i mean it happens. It's it's weird timing. Yeah, it's just weird. Um, so without further ado, uh, Miss Helene, what is tell us more about what this chapter is about. Yes. So this is the one where Harry is reeling as he comes to terms with losing his wand, and his anger towards Dumbledore keeps growing. This anger isn't helped any by Hermione's late, latest acquisition from Bathilda's house, The Life and Lies of D- Albus Dumbledore, the book. It is here that they find out one of Dumbledore's biggest secrets, his friendship with Grindelwald, who turns out to be the young man in the photo, and some staggering views on wizard supremacy. This leaves Harry wondering if a person he once looked up to really deserved all the trust Harry had placed on him. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, this one is a doozy. Like, this was a chapter that, after I finished reading it, I I felt, like, angry. (laughs) Oh, same. Like, a hundred percent. Um, Which I feel like I don't usually feel angry. And it wasn't It wasn't even just the content. I mean, it was the content, but it, it was also, like, how it was presented to the reader. Not, like, the actual mechanic of it, of, of the, the writing and the plot. Like, I have I have expressed dis- displeasement. Is that a word? Displeasure? Displeasure. That's, that's pleasure. <laughs> um, I was like, there's a word for this. I know. Um I have expressed his pleasure in, uh, in terms of like her writing and how she decided to like uh, attack certain issues and things uh, in the past. But that, so that's not what this is about. Honestly, it was more like just how how specific characters like went about doing specific things. I was like, Ur. I honestly just felt angry, f- like on Harry's behalf all over again. Yeah. Yeah, and I felt angry on my behalf just for having to fucking, like, read this, too. Like, the fact that this was something that was written, even in in the voice of Rita Skeeter, still. Like, God. Anyway. Okay, let's get into it, because you've got thoughts (laughs) on the voice of Rita Skeeter, and I feel like your politic has a lot to do with that. Yeah, do you want me to go first? Yes. So my politic this week is biased reporting. What? And I know, no right? Uh, no such thing. Uh, <laughs> a chapter that is basically just an entire excerpt from a book written by Rita Skeeter. And, you know, the politic being biased reporting. I mean, how? How? How could that possibly be? <laughs> and for, for those who uh, aren't who need a little reminder, and because I love to define my terms, the word bias um, means prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be unfair. And the, the use of reporting is is a little flexible here because technically the book that she wrote, The Life and Lies of Dumbled- Abbas Dumbledore, is not like a news article. It's not like she's not being a journal. Well, she is being a journalist, but it's it, it's weird because in this capacity, I feel like it got all mixed together. And that's part of what kind of made me angry. Right. Mm-hmm. So like Rita Skeeter is 
primarily a journalist. She writes for a newspaper. She's honestly a, like a gossip columnist, really. Yeah, if we're being, yeah. That's so, basically it. So, like, all of a sudden, she goes from being a, a journalist who writes gossip columns in a, in a newspaper, which is, a, like, a source of media and facts for people, to writing a, a biography, which I feel like usually gossip, gossip columnists do not write biographies. And if they do, they are not marketed and sold as a biography, like as a piece of nonfiction work. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of what like bias reporting really is, is just the best way to describe exactly what the fuck is going on with this book. Um, even though technically it's not a new, it's not news, you know? So basically, okay. Specifically the, the wording used in her book in the, in the, excerpts of the book that we see in this chapter are extremely selective um, and they happen to insert her opinions into the story and overall she presents the entire work as factual including the parts where she inserts her opinions and changes to very selective wording to do to portray her her thoughts and feelings on what she is is talking about so specific example is her referring to doge as dog breath doge the entire freaking like chapter she does not need to refer to doge as dog breath doge every single time she brings him up she j- literally just does d- d- does that she literally just does that to like try to undermine his his authority and like the readers faith in what he's saying by making him look what's the word making him look um unreliable by using like a stupid demeaning nickname every time they bring up his name so that's like the like one specific example but honestly and i think we're all very aware this type of reporting we see a lot especially throughout the trump campaign and all and like ever since 2016 when trump ran for president this type of reporting is often utilized over at fox news by people like tucker tucker carlson and sean hannity who along with reader rita skeeter present their opinions as facts and facts as something that are up for debate um, mm-hmm, something mm-hmm. that I'm sure that all of us really fucking hate by this point. <laughs> uh, well, and, and not just that, it's also like very transparently like a cash grab for them, just as it is for Rita Skeeter to kind of yeah. stoke these fires and then kind of be like, oh, I don't know, it's just doing my job. And like, it's it's not just doing your job. You're just creating chaos for profit. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, like bottom line, opinions are not facts. Opinions are not facts. They're just not. Like, and if you're mar- and if you're going to market your book as an uh, as a biography, which is largely, I mean, contextually, everyone tends to think of bi- of biographies as non fiction, fact based mediums to learn about a person who had lived. Um, do not include any unfounded theories that you uh you know made up. Um, and then also then make up new facts, quote unquote facts, to support your theories, because opinions are not facts and facts are not something that you can just pull out of thin air that to like support your story because you don't have any real facts to support your story. Um, and honestly, any publisher in their right mind really should have just looked at that book and decided to if they were going to sell it, which I mean, it, you know, it m- business wise, probably a good business decision because people are going to buy it. Because, you know, people fucking clamor for shit like this, especially when it's about someone as large and influ- influential as Dumbledore in the Wizarding World. But if, if a publisher looked at that and decided, okay, we're going to bend our ethical, you know, morals to sell this book, maybe they should have sold it as a fiction novel instead. Or, like, remarketed it to something that is not... Like by calling it a biography, it's just like it's demeaning to the entire genre. 
just change the name and be like, there's one this <laughs> headmaster of Gogwarts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like what, like those uh, off-brand Halloween costumes? Is yeah, that yeah, of course. The <laughs> magical yeah, so... headmaster of Gogwarts uh, named uh, Altus uh, Bumblebee. And... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. Um, that would be great. But yeah, I mean, this is what I mean by like, this shit made me angry, like physically angry. Oh, I got, I got one better. Sorry, Altoid Bumblebee. It's. I feel like we're doing like, like Benadryl Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. Yes. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's biased reporting. Um, even though it's not really report reporting, because uh, she's literally just writing a nonfiction or a fiction novel about a person that actually lived. So. Yeah, like fan fiction, uh, heavy with the like editorialization. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And honestly, like, yes, yeah, some of the things that she says in the book are true. Um, you know, some of these things did happen. Uh, but if you're going to like present those things, like you you should do it in a unbiased way by, you know, like, yes, people have a right to know that Dumbledore did at one point espouse um, those views but yes. to say like the like he l- later seemed to you know backtrack on these views because of these you know things that he did yeah. for the wizarding community or whatever yeah yeah like it's definitely something that is interesting and people do have a right i guess i, mean, I don't know if really people any have a, anyone has a right to a right to know about a person like a private citizen's life or whatever but whatever um like it's okay to to tell the facts yes he wanted he at one point thought that you know muggles should be reigned over by the wizarding world for the greater good or whatever and and befriended befriended a really awful wizard in the process but like that's that's a fact these are facts but like don't add your little color to it and make it you know and then add facts to make him look even worse on top of it to like make your story even more believable than it already was it's just yeah it's also ignoring other facts so that you can focus on your sensationalizing of this person's life yeah yeah it's like cherry picking the facts Uh, yeah yeah, that the ones that that serve her best so that that is that is my politic uh what about you (laughs) okay so my politic is the politics of exposure. So when I'm thinking about exposure, I'm not thinking expo- exposure to the elements, but you know, that feeling of kind of vulnerability. Um, so in this chapter, two of our greatest characters find themselves exposed in ways that leaves them vulnerable. Harry finds yeah. himself physically vulnerable by being without a wand, you know, an item that we've feel is arguably the best chance of survival that Harry has in the wizarding world. Um, And Dumbledore finds himself metaphorically vulnerable in Harry's view because of a secret of his past that is exposed by Rita Skeeter. Like ultimately these vulnerabilities do not do irreparable damage in the end, but they do test Harry in his quest. Yeah. I feel like, did we talk about, I feel like we talked about vulnerability recently. It wasn't a politic, like per se, but what 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 were we talking about recently that was like oh man, my brain does not wanna It's been a while, it, Helene. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry guys. It's I, been eighty four years. Yeah, uh, basically vul- what I'm I think what I'm trying to say is vulnerability has been a big um theme in the last in this book so far, if not like yeah. the last few chapters. Um it's like it's been both kind of like remembrance and memorialization and vulnerability have been kind of circling around uh, the latest. I, I want to say like the last five chapters have been pretty heavy on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that losing something so that like Harry didn't know he was that attached to the wand until he lost it. Right. Yeah, but it's something that he took for granted, like he was always going to have, like it's his tool, Um, like it it, it doesn't have an easy replacement. Um, We also know that he can't just like 
go to Ollivander's and get another wand because, like, you know, Ollivander is held captive now. So <laughs> it's just a ton of things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and as readers also, we didn't think like that would happen. So in, as, in a way, we mm. also took that for granted, like probably the first time we were reading. Like, oh, shit. What's he going to do without his wand now? Yeah, it's kind of like, it's like the metaphor that we use when, you know, what, like if you forget your phone, right? And you're yeah. like, I feel naked. Yeah, I feel exactly. naked without my phone. Like Harry feels naked without his wand. <laughs> Well, yes. Uh, I mean, if we wanted to even like go a little bit further, he he might feel um, a little bit uh, castrated without his wand. But uh, <laughs> I mean, if we're gonna ride full into the phallic, um... <laughs> yeah, and the phallic of it all, um, yeah. But also, n- not just like vulnerable and naked without his wand, but he also feels. I feel like that also makes it harder for him to learn what he does about, you know, the Grindelwald of it all, right? Like, he's already feeling vulnerable in in a certain kind of way. He's already feeling like Dumbledore didn't tell him everything. He's like, I'm here with that, like, protection now. We didn't even find the sword. And... Then now you're gonna tell me you were, like, you didn't never told me you were besties with, like, one of the like predecessors of the dark lord are you kidding me yeah i mean looking back on it like obviously when i first read this um i was shocked that here that harry like lost his wand i would never have expected it to happen and i was like this is awful and i don't know how he's gonna move forward from this but like now that you know i've you know i've been exposed to much more media and storytelling and I've read this a few times, you know, and I'm, and I'm more of a, you know, experience in the world or whatever, looking back at this, it actually kind of makes sense like in a story uh-huh. way yeah, because, that's... because like the last few times, at least like two times in the, in the recent past that I, I that I can think of, um, Harry has survived the direct confrontations with Voldemort because of his wand. Mm-hmm. Like his wand has been the reason that he has survived those, um, those encounters. And so obviously we're getting to the, to the part where he's about to like, they're about to go head to head. They need to be on even playing ground. Like, of course, Harry is, is working to make Voldemort mortal. But if Harry has this, like, one weapon that keeps him safe every time he fights Voldemort with his wand, like, that it's not going to move the story along. Like, he needs to have something. He has to, he's going to, he needs to be presented with this problem so that he can find another method to yeah, go Yeah, so, about. like, the stakes need to, like, keep rising, right? Like, storytelling-wise. Right. So, it, like, in the hero's journey, you have to lose your mentor, so he has to lose Dumbledore for sure. Um, oh. And then uh, he's been re- reliant, and some might say over-reliant, right, on his wand. Just like Voldemort has been, right? Yeah. So they both need to be, like, equaled out so that their character is really what sets them apart and not their instrument. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because in the end, we want to know, you know, just Harry and just Voldemort, no extra accoutrements. Who would win? And exactly. we find that out. So And find out we do eventually. Yes, exactly. All right. So can you tell us about your quote for biased reporting, aka Fox News? Yes. Um, so it's kind of I, I kind of like alluded to this a little earlier when I was talking about how like it's it's fine to present the facts that Vol- that Dumbledore um, had these really awful views back in his youth, right? But it's the adding on top of like adding in facts and selecting out facts to leave out and like basically playing around with the truth in order to sensationalize it, like you said. Um, and so that's where this quote plays into. So the quote is Astonished and appalled though his many admirers will be, this letter constitutes proof that Albus Dumbledore once dreamed of overthrowing the statute of secrecy and establishing wizarding rule over muggles. What a blow for those who have always portrayed Dumbledore as the Muggleborn's greatest champion. 
How hollow those speeches promoting muggle rights seem in the light of this damning new evidence. How despicable does Dumbledore, Albus Dumbledore appear, busy plotting his rise to power when he should have been mourning his mother and caring for his sister. Like, literally the last three sentences are her opinion. Mm-hmm. Like, the first sentence, that's a fact. Like, the letter constitutes proof that he once dreamed of overthrowing the statute of secrecy and establishing wizard rule over muggles. That's the fact. But what you're when you're writing a piece of, of news, when you're reporting or when you're writing a biography about a person, really what you're supposed to be doing is presenting that fact and letting the reader form their own thoughts and emotions and opinions about that fact. Well, and, and when you're doing that, right, like you want to provide as much information as possible. So like, yes, yes, yes. that happened, but also there must have been like op-eds that Dumbledore has written for the Daily Prophet that talk about, you know, similar things and and show that he has backtracked on these beliefs so that the reader can say like, oh yeah, but 20 years later he said this and I will let it up to you, the reader, to kind of untangle whether the real Dumbledore is the 17-year-old Dumbledore who wrote these letters in private or the public-facing Dumbledore, right? Like something like that. Exactly, yeah. When you're writing a, a piece of news or reporting on on something, the, these la- I mean, yeah, these these sentences just like they add nothing. They don't teach a, they don't teach the reader anything they didn't already know. Mm-hmm. They're literally just her thoughts, um, and they're literally only there to influence the reader to f- feel and think the same things that she is feeling and thinking. Correct. Um. And that's just despicable. It's just not, it's not responsible reporting. Um, Correct. (laughs) And I don't, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe others have different views on what a biography should be. Um, But I would never pick up a biography, especially a biography and not an autobiography, like an autobiography that like uh, when the right when the person is writing about their own life, obviously they're not going to want to make themselves look like a complete dick. So like when you read an autobiography, you're probably not going to read a book, the book, and come out of it like, "Wow, I hate that person," because that person wrote it, right? Like they're not going to want to make everybody hate them unless they're like a terrible writer, in which case, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But like a biography is like when you're writing a biography about someone else, especially someone who is, who is deceased and has no say in what goes in the book because they have, they cannot defend themselves. Um, even after the book is published, they have no way to defend themselves after what comes out in the book. Right? Like you have some responsibility to, to not just shit on that person's grave. Because you have the platform, you have people's attention, and you're writing about this person's life, and they have no way to defend themselves. Like, you have a responsibility as an author of of a biography of this nature to not do exactly what she's doing, and she's just fucking doing it. Yep. So. (laughs) As you can tell, I'm not happy about it. (laughs) I I can I uh, what I can never I know. tell. I know. <laughs> All right. So thank you for your quote. My quote uh, is more about Harry, obviously, because that's yeah. what I was focusing on. Um, and it goes, and his fury at Dumbledore broke over him now like lava, scorching him inside, wiping out every other feeling. Out of sheer desperation, they had talked themselves into believing that Godric's hollow held answers, convinced themselves that they were supposed to go back that it was all a part of some secret path laid out for them by Dumbledore. But there was no map, no plan. Dumbledore had left them to grope in the darkness, to wrestle with unknown and undreamed of terrors, alone and unaided. Nothing was explained. Nothing was given freely. They had no sword, and now Harry had no wand. And he had dropped the photograph of the thief, 
and it would be surely easy now for Voldemort to find out who he was. Voldemort had all the information now. Yeah, he's. it's basically showing how helpless he feels. It's like spiraling also like he's lost everything. Like he's lost his wand. He's potentially lost his respect for, for Dumbledore. And he's yeah. lost the picture, you know? So he's like, he's at rock bottom, honestly. Yeah. And I mean, the good news is it really probably can only go up from here. (laughs) Hot tip. It can only go up from here. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So who did you feel like, I mean, I'm sure that, that we kind of know who was your character for this chapter? Oh, Hermione. Just kidding. No, it's Rita motherfucking Skeeter. (laughs) Hermione, the person I have not even talked about once yeah. in this conversation. I mean, obviously, obviously, it's Hermione. No, of course. Who else? Who else? Who else? And you, I'm sure I mean, we all know you who her, yours is. Like, I just looked blankly at Helene. Like, <laughs> what is happening? Yeah, like Her- Hermione. It's like you—you you can see the doc too. You see what I've written down. So, oh, I girl, mean, I'm not what? even looking at the doc right now, girl. <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, I, I'm looking I, at your I face as one does. <laughs> yes, my beautiful, beautiful face. Um, I, I bet I could guess who who yours is as well. I mean, Grindelwald, obviously. Yeah, he was really exposed in this chapter. Grindelwald, <laughs> Grindelwald exposed. Uh, obviously, it's Harry. Um, because he just feels physically and emotionally exposed in this chapter which is a, a very physically exposed is he streaking well because you know he doesn't have his wand Helene. yeah <laughs> damn i feel like that's still more emotionally exposed it, this is not <laughs> equus okay um <laughs> that is a deep cut for listeners <laughs> uh, for, for fans of daniel radcliffe um Anyway. AKA me. Yeah, Yeah, no, this is basically a joke for just Helene. (laughs) As as are many of my jokes. Anyway. (laughs) 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 Um, Yeah, like, and I feel for Ari because I too struggle with vulnerability of any form. (laughs) So like... Feeling yeah. physically vulnerable? No thanks. Don't like it. Feeling emotionally vulnerable? No thanks. I don't like it. So, yeah. Yeah. Would I overreact if I felt emotionally vulnerable? Fuck yes. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, Hermione is the one that has to deal with that. So, And in our case, you're the one who has to deal with that. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, if Daniel Radcliffe wants to physically expose himself to me, I will be fine with that. Oh my god. <laughs> so much. This is so wrong. <sighs> I mean, I'm not saying no. <laughs> you know, like, what I'm imagining right now is like, you know, like, the typical, like, you know, trench coat flasher her situation. <laughs> Hey, you know what? It's all you good. take it. You take it. I know you would, but please. <laughs> Should we talk about how we see each other's politics in this series? Uh, yes, please. Let's not talk about trench coat flasher Daniel Radcliffe, please. Um, okay, so the politics of bias reporting. I feel like we've seen, obviously, bias reporting throughout um, the series and not just with Rita Skeeter, we've seen how like the Ministry of Magic wields the daily profit as a tool of propaganda to kind of obfuscate what's going on in the Ministry of Magic when they're not sure what's going on with Voldemort and, and all the the stuff. And then after Voldemort takes power, they also weaponized uh, the daily profit to do their bidding. So bias reporting... Oh, abounds in the wizarding world yeah media is definitely one of the largest uh weapons that that is used especially in the second rise of voldemort yeah Uh, that voldemort he had some media training in those intervening years you know (laughs) honestly he did he's like you you know how i will win hearts and minds (laughs) 
PR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, he he has his own publicist hidden away somewhere. Why yeah, it's not? Lucius Malfoy. With right, like Lily, Lily, stop chewing on my cords, please. Yes, it's, yep, it's Lucius Malfoy with three of his peacocks. <laughs> the peacocks, yes, the peacocks. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, bias reporting for sure. I, I could see all of those. For exposure, I feel like what's coming to mind, well, first what comes to mind is well, we're talking about the loss of a wand, right? And feeling powerless and vulnerable due to the loss of that wand. Um, so I think immediately of when Ron lost his wand in, in the second year mm-hmm. um, because it was broken and was no longer working. So I can imagine how Ronald felt after that. Um, I would say probably Harry in um, Goblet of Fire when mm-hmm. he lost his support system. Um, with Ron not speaking to him for a majority of that. And then also the parallel of that here in Deathly Hallows when Ron and Hermione, or Ron and Harry and Hermione lose Ron a second time um, when he abandons them, feeling emotionally vulnerable and exposed without having, you know, that person that they're so used to relying on being there. Um, And then... Dumbledore, when he breaks that ring in this and Mm -hmm. realizes his fate and his mortality looming and having to reconcile with with that. And it's kind of similar then to Voldemort after realizing that all of his horcruxes are gone. Um. Yeah. Stripped away. Okay, so I have a stupid probably question. I mean, because, you know, my questions <laughs> no. are pretty much all stupid. But, like, this losing of the wand prompted me to think, how did Voldemort get his original wand back after, like, what whole thing? the whole thing of, like, so, okay, so, he, okay, bear with me. So he... Uh, he goes October 31st yeah. to murder the Potters, right? Yeah. With his wand. There, he vanishes into thin air or yeah. whatever, you know, basically, you know, his, his, yeah. one of his horcruxes, right? Like, goes and inhabits a snake or whatever. What I, happened to that I mean, wand and how does he get back to that, like, I bet poor wand? I, I would assume does, that, like, Someone like Wormtail or possibly Wormtail himself went back and retrieved it. Yeah. From Godric's Hollow. Like like in the intervening yeah. eleven years. I would assume right? he went back and retrieved someone went back and retrieved it. Okay, probably yeah, but who Wormtail. had it though in those eleven years? I'm I So he like fakes his death. See, he goes, he gets his Yeah, wand, I mean, he doesn't wand, need a wand Voldemort's when he's, wand like, a floating person on the back of someone's head. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. I know that. But I'm thinking logistically. I'm not talking, like, I'm t- thinking logistically. So, Wormtail goes, gets Voldy's wand, right? Fakes his own death, like, confronts Sirius and fakes his own death, and lives with the Weasley family. Where does he stash I mean, maybe Voldemort's he wand, though? gave it. Gave it to another Death Eater to hold on to. Yeah, like maybe or, Lucius I mean, had it or know, something. Maybe, maybe Wormtail had an apartment that he just paid rent on and never lived at. I'm, now I'm imagining a rat paying rent. House. How would he have paid rent? <laughs> <laughs> He like a little rat. Well, a little rat the two he rat, would go and find um, a chef holding a little a check in his mouth like taking his walk down to the leasing office and dropping the check on. No, no, no. Like Remy from Ratatouille, <laughs> he would go find a British chef like Gordon Ramsay yeah. and get then under his little chef, chef hat deliver and, like, his rent check every month. <laughs> correct. And also yell at his like staff, that makes that makes Gordon Ramsay <laughs> makes so much more sense now. Gordon Ramsay is Wormtail, is what you're saying. 
No, no, no. He's not Wormtail. He's being controlled by Wormtail via a Ratatouille. But Ratatouille can't, con- can't control how the gu- what the guy says, just how he moves. Yeah, but he's got like, that's true. magic. That's true. On I top forgot we're all. living in Come on, within the conf- confines of the wizarding world. Yeah, makes it all <laughs> all the more interesting. <laughs> Yeah, when words worlds gosh, up. Ratatouille. <laughs> Maybe he was a wizard after all. He's an animagus. Oh, you know, <laughs> weirder things have happened. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's talk about our Dementors and Chocolate this chapter. <sighs> For those of you who. Maybe this is your first episode or you you haven't been listening for a while. Uh, Dementors and Chocolate is where we talk about the things we fucking hated in the chapter and the things we didn't hate so much. So, Helene, what did you hate um, with a passion? This one was more of like a, like, what the fuck kind of thing. So that I, like, never really thought about. So Uh in the book, uh in the chapter, it says Rita used Veritaserum on Bethilda while interviewing her for the book. That's just like a throwaway line in in the in the chapter and so i have a few questions yeah about that. yeah <laughs> one did bethelda know that she was being drugged that that she was being given fair to serum when being interviewed for the book one two could rita have maybe been lying about using the veritas serum in the book to make it seem like her claims were more reliable and then ultimately mm-hmm. of those two options which is worse I feel like there are no winners here. Like there is no combination of where I'm like, that's better than yeah, the I other mean, one. You know, like they're both bad. I could, there are like, if the re- reporter was a reliable one, right? Not Rita Skeeter, AKA. I I could see like in the wizarding world, going to do an interview for something that is very important and agreeing to take Veritas serum and going on the record for taking Veritas serum so that the readers are assured that, the recounting of my story is accurate as much to my, to as much to my like recollection. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously I can only tell the truth as, as I know it. Like telling, giving someone Veritas serum doesn't make every single thing they say true. It, because like Bethilda could have been misled or not known something. And so it's not like she would magically know something or know, know something different if she had been given Veritas serum. So I could see that being the case, but that mm-hmm. on top of the fact that Bethilda was very elderly, probably not in her right mind um, when she was being interviewed for this book in the beginning, um, especially because also in the same sweep of her saying that she, you know, gave her bear to serum or whatever, she also says that she was batty and and going crazy and just really not all there when she gave the interview. So like it just really it's really given off like taking advantage of the elderly vibes. Uh, yeah, um, it's not yeah, good. It's elder it's not abuse. Great. Well, it's taken. It's taken not only it's giving you know elder abuse, but it's also giving like taking advantage of yeah. vulnerable people, right? So by all accounts, Matilda wasn't like in her best mind, like mind frame, yeah, or yeah. like consent wise either like if she consented she didn't know what she consented to probably so also like it might have just been like you know rita just right made up this stuff and is like who's gonna say no like there was that that there was that note that came with the book which was like part of like it's like half of my dementor because i have another one um which is like Matilda, you said every word, even yeah, if you don't yeah. remember, kind of thing, saying them. Oh. It was like such gaslighty language to use yeah. that pisses it's me awful. off. Um, um, yeah, and, yeah. And like on my second point, too, like it, it is 100% possible. I could see Rita totally just like, you know, Matilda is old. Uh, by the time that the book came out, she was dead. So, like, she, she could easily have just said that she used Veritaserum and no one would be able to to like d- contradict her on that 
and just saying that she used yeah. Ranta serum to verify the facts um, will just make her look more reliable and make all the claims that she's making in the book that are her f- opinions um, seem more like facts. Uh, and uh, Bethilda can't stop her or or say, hey, that's not what happened. Okay, so uh, I already said like one of my Dementors, but my real Dementor, yeah. honestly, the whole like for the greater good is like some bullshit yep, yep, yep. <laughs> that I'm really angry about. Uh, and I'm really sad that Dumbledore's like brilliant mind yeah. was the one who came up with it, even if he didn't believe in it in the end. I mean, I think that it's a great show of like using your your power and your knowledge for good versus using it for evil like Dumbledore we kind of get to see both sides of that coin like the potential that comes from using his immense knowledge and power yeah. for for evil versus the potential that he ended up the thing that he ended up going for which was the potential of using all of his knowledge and power for good well, it also goes to show, like, one, be careful who you associate with, even in yeah. your youth, right? Because you never know. And two, before you commit yeah. to some, like, vision or, or commit to to sharing an idea, think it through, you know? Because you never know how it can be portrayed later. Not even portrayed, yeah, but I used mean, later, you know? Yeah, there there's something to be said about especially in this day and age when everybody's on social media and everybody's putting their life on social media. And there's something, there's something to be said about like being young and stupid and not, I mean, your prefrontal cortex, like your impulse control and your decision-making has not fully been formed yet when you're that age. Um, I think with men, I don't, I don't think it fully forms until you're in your early twenties. And I think that Dumbledore was like 18 at this point. Um, yeah. 17, I believe. Um, and I think there's like the definitive studies on, you know, brain development show yeah, that yeah. 25 for is men, around the For age men, for men. I think for women it's earlier. Injury. But yeah, yeah, I think like latest it's about 25 or 26 for men. Um, so like there is something to be said. Like when you're, when you're younger, you're stupider. That's just the truth. Like he, he doesn't have as much life experience. He hasn't really fully formed his, his view on the world. He probably hasn't met or interacted with enough muggles to realize that he doesn't want to control them, you know, which I mean, sounds awful. Well, and it, it also comes from that idea of like, of course I'm better than them. Like I would know better than everybody. You're like, you know, you you can't you're the fucking ruler of the world at that age. You know, nothing nothing can happen to you. Um, but but you know, it, it's so and it's so similar to like it really gives me it reminds me of like the times when like people, like celebrities and stuff, like people find images of them in like blackface from when they were in college or whatever. You know, like it's kind of the same, right? Like these people had shit views back in the day and they learned and they grew, but they put it online for everyone to see. And now it's out there and you can't take it back. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Um, Let's talk about things that make us want to vomit less, which is our chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I say the chocolate can also be something that's a net positive. <laughs> Too. Okay, well, whatever. <laughs> it's not just like, oh, I didn't hate this as much. It's like, sometimes I actually really like Okay, this. well, today I just <laughs> didn't hate this as much, okay? Like, I I am feeling okay. angsty just like Harry. I, I've been through <laughs> shit, okay? I feel vulnerable emotionally, if not physically. You know I don't deal well with it, just like my boy Harry. <laughs> yeah, no, I get you. I get you. Uh, Do you want me to say mine first? Yes, please. Okay, so mine's a quote. Uh, This is my chocolate. He changed, Harry. He changed. It's as simple as that. Maybe he did believe these things when he was 17, but the whole of the rest of his life was devoted to fighting the dark arts. Dumbledore was the one who stopped Grindelwald, the one who always voted for muggle protection and muggle-born rights, who fought you-know-who from the start and who died trying to bring him down. 
So yeah, just basically that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Of of Hermione reminding Harry that that, you know, who Dumbledore was when he knew him and how he grew and and tried to right those wrongs that that uh he made when he was younger and make up for them. Mine is related to yours. Mine was when Hermione was like, hey, you know, like he loved you, you know he did or whatever. And I was like, Well, Hermione, do we know? But whatever, you're trying. So I, I mean, guess it's my I think that it's his actions spoke louder than his words sometimes and his actions there were actions that really showed that he loved Harry there are obviously a lot of actions that showed that like he didn't give a shit about Harry um <laughs> this is what we call mixing I mean <laughs> he's a complex character you know he this is why people really either love or hate Dumbledore it's like really hard to be in between because He's very polarizing. Same with Snape. Same, you know, like they're both very polarizing complex characters. Fine. I choose to make I, I agree with Hermione. I choose to believe he loved him. But I understand okay. the I, arguments of against it. Okay, maybe it's just this chapter hit me differently. Obviously, I'm going through some things emotionally. Yeah, yeah. With like what just happened and stuff, and I'm feeling vulnerable, so I feel a little bit on edge, just like Harry, because I don't like feeling emotionally <laughs> vulnerable. So, <Yeah>. like, <laughs> as the Enneagram Eight that I am, <laughs> this is very, this is very illustrative of our Eight Two dynamic. Yeah. You're like, of course, like you yeah. know, he did love, you know, and I'm like, mm, I don't know, I'm, this is all sus <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I see you. I see what you mean. <laughs> All right. So uh, last time we did an episode, we asked a question, Helene. And this question was, who, what, or where is your idea of home and why? And do we get some answers? Because both of our lives were absolutely insane crazy and I am awful. Um, I <laughs> did not, not post <laughs> this to social media. Therefore, I did not give a lot of our listeners the usual opportunity to tell me their answers on social media in an easy, accessible way to them. Um, but despite my shortcomings, we did still um, have a listener who reached out uh, and told us their answer, even though I never technically asked it on social media. So thank you, listener Katya. For answering this question, um, so I have something to read when I did not do my job. Um, <laughs> so Katya's answer to this question, she goes, on your question this week about home, I have two answers. One, I'm immensely proud of being a homeowner. I'm a millennial and a single mom doing this on one income. I bought a house a few years ago with my own damn money. It's not perfect, but it's all mine, and I get to decorate and do what I want with it, and that is priceless. And two, home is where the Wi-Fi connects automatically. I loved this very much, this whole answer. Yeah, no, I love everything about yes, it. Thank you so much, Katya, for for sharing this with us. And hell yeah, I mean, you, you did the thing, and uh, it's fucking awesome. So congrats. I am so happy for Katya that one, she was able to get a house. And two, I love the sentiment of like where wherever the Wi-Fi connects to automatically is yeah. home. Cause that is such yes, a like I will say I have thing. more than one place where my Wi-Fi connects automatically. So I guess all of those places are home, which I'm fine with. Yeah. That's it. Those places are home. Yeah. So last time we talked, Helene, you said, you know, where your cats were was kind of home. Has that been, like, did you think of other places that embody home or things that embody home to you? Uh, honestly, I, I I do stand by where my cats are because when I, especially like, I, I feel like the, the timing of this is perfect because I just spent a week back at my child, like in my childhood. Yeah, childhood home. Although technically, my parents moved out of my house, the house that I lived in my childhood. It's just, it's, but it's still the same town. Um, and it's weird because, in a way, that still feels like home, but it also does not feel like home at the same time. 
because I have made I have made okay. my own home here and I have, you know, a place that like Katya said, I have a place that like I built. I I didn't build my apartment, but like I I was able I'm able to afford this all of my it's something that's my own, right? Like no one gave this to me. No one you know, ha- no one has any other say about what happens or goes on in my apartment because it's my apartment. It's my it's my home. So I feel okay. that. But at the same time, like when you go home, I feel like home is two things. Home is one where you feel completely comfortable and like a, a place where you just feel like you can completely be yourself. And then two, a place that feels intensely familiar a place that is not scary it's not unknown it's something that you don't have to worry about that doesn't change I think I think that's what I would say I think for me um obviously wherever my dogs are you know if we don't have Gael Emmy and Cleo I mean where what are we doing in our lives right obviously Olivia has to be in the list yeah. too. And so does Seth. Family. Family. Um, family uh, the little family we've built together. Also, I feel like my idea of home is very much um, food based as well. Like wherever I could get access oh. to good Puerto Rican food yeah. is home, you know? Yeah. <laughs> food is where you have um, a favorite restaurant nearby. <laughs> Also, like, we just spent 10 days in El Paso um, because, as I said earlier, the passing in the family and then Thanksgiving. Um, and we lived in El Paso for about uh, three to four years. And going back after living in San Antonio for five years ha- was kind of like a culture shock again. Because <laughs> we're like, oh, we can't just, like, go and find this at like a million targets because we've got like a million targets in San Antonio and like four in the whole of El Paso, you know, Um, or, you know, just little things like that. And kind of like having to navigate back a smaller city when we're used to like the convenience of a bigger city. Oof, that was tough. And like not only is San Antonio – a pretty like mid-sized city but also we've got austin an hour away so if san antonio doesn't have it for sure austin will have it but like el paso is just like the biggest city in that area (laughs) so it's like if you can't find it there good luck oh yeah yeah home is also where you feel comfortable right so um where you can find port- for me it's like the puerto rican food for sure there are no good puerto rican restaurants in el paso don't come for me people it's true i've uh, eat- eaten at them all no good for not to my standards anyway um and where my my puppies and my peeps are you know yeah totally i agree with that All right, so this time around, we are wondering if there's ever been a moment where you've questioned why you used to look up to someone. So just like Harry, when he was like, why did I look up to Dumbledore again? I mean, we all, I feel like that's a rite of passage. It's the rite of like growing up. When did you feel like that and why? And did you get over it? Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, definitely. And I think that we all have at least one person that we can point to. Um, uh, you mean one author of a series? Uh, maybe. Yeah, that could be what I'm talking about. Uh. <laughs> hmm. Who keeps digging themselves into a bigger grave, in my personal opinion. And who recently just which... got the um, support of Helena Bonham Carter, which just boggles the mm-hmm. mind. Yeah. Um, yeah that person so many thoughts that person okay well (laughs) yay anyway uh speaking of celebrities let's talk about the media we've been consuming (laughs) yeah um i uh, have not watched wednesday yet it's in my uh, list of things to watch on netflix so sorry kids have not watched it yet do not have yet any opinions on it yeah. Um, did you want to go with what you have watched? Did you want to say? 
I mean, I have okay. I've been watching art, high cinema, uh, as they call it. So that's either uh, you're, you're either watching... talking about a trash reality TV show or a kids show, one of the two. Correct. You are correct. <laughs> Which one? I am talking about a kids show. <laughs> Amazing! Amazing! <laughs> it's. It's cinematic, it's high art, and it's got some of the best right, damn writing in oh the universe. Gosh. It's called Bluey, and it's on Disney+. Oh Plus. my goodness. And each episode is about eight or nine minutes, and they're fantastic. Blue, Bluey, for those who are uninitiated. Uncultured, like maybe? Um, uncultured, uncouth. Uh, <laughs> is a show about a family of dogs, oh, animated oh dogs, God. Australian animated okay, dogs. Okay. Um, and they, they have the mom, the dad, Bluey, one of the daughters, and Bingo, the other daughter. Um, and they are the Gila family. So <laughs> literally Bluey's name is Bluey Gila. <laughs> like Bluey Gila. Oh my it's gosh. so cute. I love it so wow. much. Okay. <laughs> it's my favorite thing <laughs> i'm so very proud of you happy for you not proud of you happy for you i know you say this condescendingly <laughs> but it doesn't even touch okay, my heart because this good. show is amazing great um <laughs> and our niece our niece our 21 year old niece is also obsessed with it so we've been comparing notes <laughs> perfect <laughs> You'll get there, Helene. One of these days, you're gonna be like, "I've been missing out on uh, on cinema on high I art." I mean, I don't ever plan to have a child, so probably not. One day you will be perusing. No, see, something I don't think that I'm and... ever going to just watch a kids' show on my own volition with no actual reason to do so. Um. Okay. Well, one day you will be babysitting. <laughs> no, I will not. Your niece, Olivia Wilson. I never agree to this. She will. <laughs> I will. Guys, she says she I cares. Will, uh, I, will, I, will, I, will, I, I will babysit her when she is a teenager and therefore will watch something I actually want to watch. You do not know what you're missing out on, but it's okay. It's okay. <sighs> Remain uncultured. Okay. Sounds it's good. fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. So if if you're not watching uh, the, <laughs> the the cinematic universe of Bluey, what are you doing with your life? Uh, well, I mean, so the last week at home with my family um, always brings new things. Be, uh, media wise because that's what my family does to bond we watch movies and television together so one of the things we watched was disenchanted which was enjoyable uh the sequel to the enchanted movie with uh, amy adams and patrick dempsey mm-hmm. um we also watched um a show called loot on apple tv with maya rudolph um and adam scott it's a comedy uh, 20 minute episodes, very um, entertaining. Uh, I also played the new Pokemon game uh, and I read a, well, technically listened to a book uh, called My Favorite Half Night Stand by Christina Lauren, one uh, an author that you recommended, but I don't think you'd read this one. Oh no, I've read this one. Yes, I've read. You all have read books. this one. All of their books. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. I could. I couldn't. I thought maybe you hadn't read this one. Oh, it's, um, it's just not one of my faves of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the it was definitely the one where the plot stood out to me the most in terms of like something I wanted to read, and I think overall I liked it. You know, it didn't tug on my heart heartstrings quite as much as like people we meet on vacation because I feel like it didn't really do the work to build that core relationship before they tried to introduce all the feelings into it. Because uh, for those who have not read the book, the, the two, the two protagonists are friends and it starts by them sleeping, literally sleeping together, literally like the first chapter, I think it is, or the second chapter. 
Um, and like, and then, you know, trying to navigate with like being attracted to, to each other, but being friends and trying to date other people and not wanting to ruin the friendship and eventually realizing that they want to be together type thing. Um, so my, fa- yeah. one of my favorite Christina Lauren books, I have too many favorites, but I will give you one of, uh, actually two of my favorites. One of them is called Roomies and it's a, uh, fake marriage <laughs> plot, which, um, I know maybe you're not like a huge like fan of, but it's it's like a really good story. And the other one is in a holidays. Okay, which is great for the season. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't tend to like gravitate towards like books that go like that surround Christmas and stuff. Or stories, really, that surround Christmas. Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't celebrate Christmas. However, there are a few uh, Christmas movies that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, but I mean, I'd definitely be willing to try it. I, 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 you know, I also got myself my, I bought myself a Kindle over Black Friday, um, and hopefully, in an attempt to try and read more, act like read more books rather than listen, because I feel like I just don't have always have the time to like listen to an entire 10 hour audiobook. Um, but I feel like I read faster and therefore if I like make more time to actually read, I will get through more books. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so that is the plan. I definitely am going to make an extensive TBR list, but yeah, I mean, overall I, I did enjoy my favorite half night stand. I just, um, I did not really like the main character, the main girl character that much. I liked her, but, like, I could not relate to her at all. It's like, I don't, I don't, I can't see where you're coming from on these things. And she's kind of, she's kind of, like, a horrible person for a lot of it. Like, she lied and she did all these things. And, like, it was a lot of, like, fake conflict. And that, like, I'm like, you, this was unnecessary. Like, this didn't have to, this conflict is, like, just to make the plot more interesting. But it's not something that is necessary. I feel um, like I just have done you a disservice by starting you off with Emily Henry. Because, <laughs> like... Yeah, I definitely have a high standard now. Because, for sure. So, so the thing with, <laughs> with, like, Emily Henry's novels, the, the three of them that have been published so far, is that they're so fucking good, right? Like, like you're like... Yeah, her, her story writing I'm already going to be able to tell is going to be unmatched. Like, there's no... Like, her plotting and her character development, I, like, yeah, I, had, no I did like not her. see that. Like, yeah. I, again, that's why I'm telling you there's only three, like, Emily Henry mm-hmm. novels and there's, like, 20 Christina, Christina Lauren novels because it's a it's a yeah. churning out of quality versus I quantity. Don't, I, I, yeah, I don't think that I'm going to, like, m- really regret reading any of the stories or, like, thoroughly dislike them. I'm just – I'm going to have crit- critics, critiques for them because, you know, I – I have standards now. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> they're not going to meet my standards, but I, that doesn't mean I'm not going to enjoy, enjoy every single story. No, well, that's, that's no. the thing you enjoy. You, you kind of have to walk into them being like, this is not going to be what I go for depth. Right. Sometimes like, this yeah. is what I go for. S- like, yeah. Oh. Like I just want a cute little romantic story. You yeah. Know? yeah. And, so, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I will say I did really like the character of Reed. I thought that it was a good um he was the main like the male protagonist in the in this in the book. And I think that they like I mean I just I I love a, an emotionally mature sensitive man. And he was that. Plus on top of that he was hella smart and um although that I I was going I'm going to say like sexy however one thing i did notice with christina lauren is that you get no actual descriptors of physical appearance all she does is like like in the perspective of the other person that's talking says like this person is gorgeous this person is sexy it doesn't say like oh he has brown hair oh she has blonde hair oh she is six five you know, like, like you literally don't get any physical descriptors. It's just like, I think the writing is meant to make the reader just imagine the sexiest person they can think of and have that person be the character. Mm-hmm. 
So you you keep saying she, but it's actually two people, Christina Lauren. Oh, is that is oh, okay? I assume that was okay. Yeah. All so, right. Well, so there are two authors who write together. So Christina Lauren. I mean, if you want, you could maybe if you want more of a physical descriptor, I feel like someone like Sally Thorne might be someone you enjoy. Yeah, it's, and it's not because like I want to judge for myself if they're sexy or not. That's not it. I just I feel like. It takes me out of the story because in order to like really oh, immerse you have to, myself. Do you have to conjure up like whoever you want to yeah. cast in that role? Yeah. Like I want to be immersed fully in the story. And like when I read that book, whenever I like, because like, I don't know, a lot of people probably like process information differently. But when I read books, I imagine it like a movie playing in my head while I'm reading it. Like I, I picture it with my mind's eye. Because that helps me kind of like enjoy and immerse myself in the story a bit more. So I have to picture what's happening. And so when I'm reading it and those des- and it's those descriptors, it's literally these like faceless blobs walking around doing these things. And like their appearances in my mind are just constantly changing. Like one scene I'm reading it and like the main character has blonde, curly, long hair. And in another scene, she has, like, straight shoulder length strawberry blonde hair or, like, red hair. You know? It's like – and then it just kind of pulls me out of it because I'm like, I don't know what she's supposed to look like. So my my brain just makes something up different every time. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And there's, like, no features I can, like, clasp onto. So it just makes it hard for me because, like, it takes me out of the story. But that's not probably true for everybody. So – that's just me. All right. I got you. <sighs> well, that being said, <laughs> that's it for today's episode. Please join us next time as we talk about Chapter 19 of Harry Potter and the Deadly Hallows. This one's titled The Silver Doe. Yes. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, please take a second to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or spotify or wherever you happen to be listening to us right now also now that spotify wrapped just dropped i am curious to see if we showed up on anybody's spotify spotify wrapped for their podcasts because i think they do that i am an apple music user so i have no idea what happens with spotify rap like i don't get to see what people see but i would love if you would share your spotify wrapped podcast section on social media and tag us because i'd love to see who has us in there yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll, on top of that, please also, you know, give us a five five stars view because it helps new listeners discover our podcast uh, and gets word out, word of mouth. All right. Well, until then, politics managed. Support this show by going to patreon.com slash Occupolitics. Our patrons keep this show going you can find us online at occupolitics.com and we are at occupolitics on twitter facebook and instagram you can email us your thoughts at info at occupolitics.com leave us a voicemail at 915-996-1699 and you might just hear yourself on the podcast adriana wilson is the founder and creative director of the podcast Helene Karp is the producer and social media manager. Allison Pullman is the audio wizard and editor who makes us sound so good. Cover art and physical rewards are designed by Adriana Wilson. The views expressed by the hosts and guests are expressly their own and not representative of their employers or associates. Occupolitics is part of the MuggleNet family of podcasts.